All right, in our continuing discussion of oil, who knew there would be so much to know about oil? I did. <laughs> Besides me. Okay. One of the problems that you have with oil when it's cold versus when it's hot is you kind of have to think this through. So if we think about our oil pressure relief valve, which is just a ball with a spring pushing on it. All right, so we start up the engine and it's very cold outside. All right, say so it's very, very cold, so the engine's very, very thick. So it, what is the pressure going to want to be? Uh, very, very high. So what's the oil pressure ball going to do? Open. Open way up, which is going to put more oil back towards the sump, the inlet side of the pump, and a lot less going forward down the oil gallery. So you kind of think that through. I'm like, yeah, that would work that way, wouldn't it? So now we're going to have a problem. While the oil pressure ball is doing what it's supposed to do by regulating pressure, it's letting all the pressure kind of go out and not a whole lot to go forward and lubricate the engine. Well, that became a problem on radial engines. So they had to come up with a way to do that. And so they came up with a thing called a compensating oil pressure relief valve. Compensating oil pressure relief. Oil pressure <clears throat> relief. Now, let me ask all of my, my super second semester students, what else is compensating that we have talked about? Sure. Nope. Nope. Cam, right? Go, you're close. Compensated cam. Compensated cam. Where do we find a compensated cam? In a magneto. <laughs> Did anybody hear him say it? No. no I'm sorry. <laughs> the point. <laughs> point goes to Mark. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we can do double jeopardy though. <laughs> All right. And what was the compensated cam for? PK. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> to create the sudden. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, stop it. Give me some time. The sudden collapse in the field. Yeah. The sudden collapse in the field would be completely wrong. That's a good answer. I didn't even know what a compensated can. No, I think that's the condenser that you put in there. Oh, my goodness. All right. We don't want to ruin it for the guys in first semester, but since we spent all this time on it, a compensated cam is found in a magneto. And a regular cam in a magneto will fire the magneto at regular intervals. You can't fire a magneto in a, in a radial engine at regular intervals because, because the crankshaft moves in an elliptical pattern. And so they don't actually fire at the same degrees. So anyway, that's compensating just to... But compensating oil pressure relief valve has nothing to do with the timing of an engine. Uh, so what it goes back to is what I just talked about, is that somehow we want the oil to be very cold and thick, but still pump it through the engine. So in other words, we may want it to have high oil pressure when we start it, and then it can work its way down as the oil gets warm. So uh, we'll just, I've got... Uh, many large aircraft reciprocating engines have a compensating oil pressure relief valve that allows, we can start here, allows oil uh, pressure for cold, oil pressure for a cold engine to be much higher, much higher than when the engine is warm. There, that works. Uh, the higher pressure allows the thicker, higher viscosity oil to be forced through the engine bearings. The plunger of the oil pressure relief valve is held down by two springs when the oil is cold. However, when the oil warms up, the thermostatic valve opens and allows the oil pressure to remove the force from one of the springs. For normal operation, only one spring holds the pressure relief valve on its seat. And I tell you all that to tell you you think it through a little bit further, and if we just kind of go back to what we're talking about, we have very cold and thick oil that is supposed to work its way through very small openings. And well, if we think about the openings, sure, the opening uh, for the bearings, the, if we think of the engine you're working on, the uh, oil goes from the oil pump through that oil gallery, and then it goes up and it pressure feeds to the bearings. So how big was the hole in your case that was going to feed the bearings? Three sixteenths, oh, okay, three sixteenths, maybe not quite a quarter inch, right? Everybody knows what a quarter inch bolt quarter looks inch. like. Mm -hmm. 
It's the one with the quarter inch wrench. No. Uh, okay, so that's a pretty big hole. So you're thinking, well, that's a big hole, but it's going into a hole that actually is how much? How much space did you have between the crank and your bearings? A couple thousandths of an inch. That's the size of the hole. So that oil has to go, not, not the size of the hole, but the space between the bearing and the crankshaft. That's the real hole size, which is only what, a couple thousandths of an inch. And so if you only have a couple thousandths of an inch and your oil is very cold and very viscous, is it going to want to go through that or just go outside the little ball valve and back into the other side of the pump? There you go. So might as well, it's like you have no oil. You're literally starving the engine for oil. So that's why you need this compensated double spring system that just says, basically, I don't care how, how you know, what your pressure is. You're getting oil, and I'm going to force it in there if we have to go to 150 PSI here making up stuff. But yes, Steve. So since you said it allows oil pressure for a cold engine to be much higher than yes. when it is warm. Right. So when it's, does it have like a little temperature like thing in the spring that allows it to? Yes. Okay. I read that. Uh, the plunger for the oil pressure relief valve is held down by two springs. One, two. One, two. Uh, when the oil is cold. However, when the oil warms up, a thermostatic valve opens up and removes one of the springs. Takes it away. It's a little door opens. But a monkey comes in there and he pulls the spring. <laughs> monkey, you can't have an airplane without a monkey. All right. Uh, so that would make this then 15. We'll talk about oil filter. Oh, we have a question in the audience. Yes. Did you say that that was mostly a problem on radial engines? Yes, this is found on large engines. So I'll put that found on larger radial <coughs> engines. So I tried to save time there. But now guess what I'm not going to get to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hope you're happy. <laughs> All right. Janet, you caught up? Yes. Oh, shoot. I'm going to leave anyway. Oil filters, let's talk about three types. Three types. Whoa, I don't know. That makes two. So two is one. This uh, strainer screen. We are using technology that also works for windows and doors in a home. We will keep out the mosquitoes in large parts. So this is the oil pressure screen, and I, I believe I told you that most engines back in the day, this was what the filter was. This is a Lycoming filter. Continentals, believe it or not, the Continentals, they're, they're much larger. I don't know why. So uh, Lycoming was using this, and the oil will come from the inside and go out. And I told you Continental runs the other way, goes outside in. And I believe I told you that the big deal about that is when you pull a Lycoming screen out, and you guys have seen the little housing, the little screen comes out, that when you pull it, you're going to find all kinds of debris and stuff in here. Well, hopefully not, but that's where it's going to collect on the inside. So you pull it out and <laughs> clean it out, wipe your finger in there. One of the things I would do is I would take a clear container with some a little bit of kerosene in there because I had a 55-gallon uh, thing of kerosene and I didn't have to answer to anybody <laughs> to use it. So, so I would wash it and then I would inspect what was left in my little clear bucket and use a magnet and, and, uh, and check it. And I'll talk about findings and stuff, but this is the screen. So a screen, a screen, a, a tubular screen that catches larger debris and some carbon. Um, how often do I have to change my oil? Oh, you guys are so good. 25 hours. So then Lycoming came up with a service instruction where you could just take this off and bolt on a very nice kit that allowed you to have a, a spin-on type oil filter. And then I could go to 50 hours. All right. Does it? Huh? That sounds about right. For what? Your 150 has a Continental. Yeah, no, well, I have a Continental. It's $100, $950. <laughs> so All right, so uh, strainer screen. A tubular. Yeah. 
a tubular screen that catches larger debris. Eh, not my words. It'll actually catch some pretty small stuff and some carbon. Where do I get carbon? In the combustion chamber, it's going to start packing itself all over the place in there. Uh, I said light combing. Light combing is from inside out. Um, all right, so here's something that absolutely is, I could not figure out for years and years and years. And we're talking about filters in a little bit, but I know I've already mentioned this. What happens if your filter gets clogged? And you don't want that, right? Correct. So what is the fail-safe mechanism? Bad oil is better than no oil. Bad oil is better than no oil, so there must be a bypass. bypass. Yeah, take the oil release. All right, you guys have now built the light combing almost in its entirety. Where is the bypass for that screen? I have looked for years. And scratch my head. Most of that was lice. But, <laughs> and I could not figure it out. And so when I went to light combing school, I asked, where exactly is the oil filter bypass? And the guy handed me a screen and he said, it is right here. It is a strategic solder joint that is designed to explode and come apart when the pressure inside gets too great. So he said, if you ever have one out in the field and you pull it and the seam has been broken, do not attempt to re-weld it. <laughs> Wait, but if, that, if, if that bursts, is that not going to ruin your engine even more? Well, you got to figure out why did it burst. I mean, because it got all packed full of metal. <laughs> engine is pretty much already ruined at that point. And no, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll hand this around. Uh, you don't have to ruin it more than it is, but <laughs> you can see that when the solder comes undone, it doesn't blow solder everywhere. It just rips open and allows oil to come in. And now it can't get through the fine screen because it's packed full of debris. So the pressure builds and builds and builds and it explodes out this little soldered seam and just rips open. And now you can see the oil is going to come in and go through that hole and up. What happens when that little hole gets packed? Well, that's some big parts right there. <laughs> if that's happening. I don't know. Yeah, like the bearing gets stuck in there. Yeah, the bearing gets stuck in there. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, if too much debris, if too much too much debris, debris blocks the screen, blocks the screen, blocks the screen, there we go, blocks the screen, what am I going to say? Uh, the screen will burst. <coughs> the screen will burst. And allow dirty oil to flow to the engine. Well, technically, it's already in the engine, but you know what I mean. Because dirty oil is better than no oil. So screen is cleaned and reused. Wait, after it burst? <laughs> Isn't it nap time for you? Mm -hmm. It was. Okay. Oil change intervals. I N T E R V. Intervals are one half the time when using a screen. One half the time when using using a screen versus a full flow oil filter, which does say it's every 25 hours. I want to say I wrote half the time because I think there's a, there are some engines out there that you have that, they, they don't go, they are allowed 25 hour intervals with the full flow, so it's like halved again, but that would be a pretty rare engine out there. So the, it goes from 25 to 50 because so, of the, like the capacity of the filter versus the screen? Uh, yeah, we're going to look at it in a minute, but when, we, when I look at the size of this, so look at, look at how much surface area is right there versus, 
and this is not, well, compared to automotive, this is a pretty big oil filter, but for an aircraft, this is about, well, they get about that big. And that wouldn't be that, that uncommon. But look at the, where's the thing? Hold up the surface area versus the surface area of this. <laughs> so that's got a whole lot more surface area. Just a Did that come out of your plane? No. Oh, wait. No. Maybe. No. 623 Hotel. I will tell you a secret. Larry taught me something. When, he, when, the, when you guys do oil filters, right? So he's got to get like, a, where, where are you going to find a whole bunch of oil filters that haven't been cut open? Because you guys have to do this when you do inspections and stuff. And so he just goes to the airport and he goes to the trash and it's full of ones that have never been opened up and inspected. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Oh, wow. I'm like, are you serious? He's like, every year. Don't worry about it. All right. Uh, okay, the next one I want to talk about is the, the Cuno. Cuno oil filter. You're only going to see these on, I'll put this, on old, old engines, um, like the radials. I think the Ranger has one. That's the inverted six-cylinder, stuff like that. So a Cuno oil filter is this right here. Here's, this is a cutaway, right? It's, half of it's missing. Otherwise, you're going to, whoa, whoa, just come right out. But, uh, okay, so what it is, it's a whole bunch of stacked discs. And so the oil goes and it squeezed through these stacked discs. So you can see it's going to come in. Uh, well, that says outlet. So it's got, where's my inlet? My inlet. Here, an inlet is going to come through here. And it's going to go through these discs and then out the outlet. And it has to get to the inside of the discs and then out of these holes right here, then up out of the outlet. And then, of course, right here, it's got a little ball on a spring. What do you suppose that's for? Oil pressure relief valve? Bypass. Bypass. So you can see right here, it comes in, and it's going to go right into the bypass. It's right there. So if it blocks this way, it goes straight up, and you can see it comes right out of, well, it goes up. Where the heck does it go? Across the top. Yeah, oh, across the top, right in. I, I can see what I turned around. Okay. So here's the weird thing about these. Now, when I first encountered these, because they did work in a place that worked on a lot of antique stuff, I'm like, wow, how do you deal with this? And the, the mechanic goes, well, you just do this. There's a, there's a handle on the top, and you just rotate the handle. And yeah, it needs some lubrication and some love. Um, and it's got all these combs in there, and this combs in between there. And you just rotate that, and it cleans it out. Now imagine, if you will, this is just sticking in the engine like that. And you just rotate it, it cleans it out. Where's the dirt go? OK, where's the dirt go? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, you got to take the drain plug out and, and drain it. And uh, that was the funny thing, though. He just twisted a couple times. There you go, it's clean. All right, so Cuno filter, a series of stacked discs with one stationary set of discs and a set of rotating discs. So, I don't know why that seems awful wordy, but a series, a series of stacked discs. Discs, um, one, it's not really one, yeah, one stationary, and one that rotates. Uh, that works. Rotating, rotating the discs, cleans them out. Nope, never have to replace it. Believe it or not, no. So, and this is not my, this is right out of a book. After, I F, geez, thinking faster. After long intervals, your guess is good as mine. We didn't know long interval is. Uh, but I want to say, like, the Continental 220, the TBO on that thing is only like 500 or 700 hours. It's not much. So after long intervals, uh, the filter is removed and cleaned. Remove. 
removed and cleaned. And the thickness between the discs, um, I don't want to say this, the thickness, it determines the size of uh, dirt that it filters out. So, um, yeah, the thickness between the discs uh, determines, determines the uh, particle size that can be filtered out. Antique engines, probably, well, it depends on which engine, but I would say somewhere in the 40s. But, like, why? but I mean, they're still there. You get an old engine, it's still going to have it. In my opinion, the two cheapest things for my aircraft is this part, which is about 35 bucks, and, and five quarts of oil. <laughs> and what? Fuel. Nah, well, I get good fuel, too. I don't go to Arco. Nothing against Arco. Yeah, they have top-tier gasoline. The radio sends All right, then the, the third one is the, f uh, the full flow or spin-on spin on oil filter. It uses, wait a minute, I think I have pictures. Let's see. There we go. Oh, there's my screen on the right and my full flow on the left. Uh, let's see. Mm, anything we need to know here? Oh, here it is right here. So I think I'm missing some parts on the inside. Here it is. So all of this paper came off of this, and it's all coiled up in there like that. And so every time I change the oil on my aircraft, I take this open, we have a special opener, you cut it open, and then take a knife and you cut all the paper out, and then you take the paper, and at a minimum, you're going to stretch it out and inspect it. And this, one, this one's been in use for me by a while. And it has some metal flakes in it, which are kind of interesting. Have you ever had to overhaul the engine in your plane? No, I haven't had it very long. It's only got 400 hours on it anyway. So you take it out, and uh, well, first thing you do is you hold your breath, and you hope that you don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, whoa. one time, one summer, I spent the summer overhauling the same engine over and over again. And I put it on, did I tell you this story? No. I, you guys would lie anyway, right? No, you didn't. <laughs> now I need something to wipe my hands with. All right, the thing about this is you really are, should be wearing gloves when you do stuff like this. But, I mean, my age, how much longer am I really going to live? Uh, because there's a lot of combustion products in here, all of the lead. Um, this is a lot of bad stuff. But this is obviously extremely clean. Uh, it has been rinsed and washed and all kinds of stuff. Otherwise, it wouldn't look like this. It would be oily, uh, stinking oily mess. But, by the way, you probably don't need me to pass that around. You're just going to be gross. So, all right. Um, let's see. Full flow it uses cellulose paper in there. Some of them, now this shows you right here that it's got, right in here, that it has some sort of bypass valve, which because you've got to have some sort of bypass valve, right? Because what happens if it clogs up? It's the same concept. But I have taken this one apart, and I have this part, and all the paper, and that other part that I can't find right here. And do you see a bypass valve anywhere? No. no. There is no bypass valve, I will tell you. So there's, there is zero bypass valve on this. So where's the bypass valve then? It's built into the engine. So that's why it's important to get the right part number, not just one that fits. Some of them have bypass valves, some do not. So this particular one has a new inlet design 
uh, for approximately 30% greater inlet flow area. It says so right on there. That's cool. That's cool. Right. So let's see, full flow spin on uses cellulose. Well, it's not really so paper. Actually, it's cellulosic paper. Metal flakes. That's it. Well, that's bad enough. <laughs> what else? What else should I be looking for? Carbon Something with a part number on it, a gear tooth. <laughs> uh, you can get some carbon in there. I don't get excited about carbon, especially if there's not much. You know, you're gonna get some. That's just not a big deal. Um, even if you get a little sludge, well, that's not a big deal. What if you find your monkey in there? <laughs> I would probably cry. Poor monkey. <laughs> Got drowned. So oil flows from outside. Oil flows from outside to inside. Which means once you pull the can apart, you pull this part right out of the can, you're looking. I already cut the paper off, but you can just spread the paper right there and start looking at it. So you don't have to cut it and then be surprised. You can you can pull it out and look at it, and if you just overhauled an engine you pretty much know almost immediately if your day just went to heck in a handbasket or not. So one time I overhauled this engine. It was a light coming, probably like a, I don't know, 320, 360. It was a four-cylinder, I remember that much. And so I, the procedure is uh, you take it out and you run it, and I forget, it's uh, somewhere around two hours or something like that. But you do a series of increasing horsepower steps until you get to max horsepower. Then you run it at max horsepower for a pretty, pretty short period of time. And then you shut it down and you drain the oil out and you weigh the oil. And at that point, I would usually change out the filter at the same time just because of dirt and stuff. Put on a new filter, put the oil back in, new filter, start it up, warm it up, and then you go up to max power and you just leave it at max power for, I don't know what it was, an hour or two. And uh, you just run it right there at max power for that whole time and shut it down. So... Anyway, so I did the first, first set of runs, run up the power. thing ran great. Uh, shut it down, uh, open up the drain to start draining the oil, grab the filter, open it up, cut it, pulled it out, and it looked like silver metallic paint. It was just, oh, no, this is bad. <laughs> it was aluminum pigmented paint is what it was at that point. And it was horrific. So something bad had happened. So... I took the whole engine apart, and uh, we sent it, and it was, oh man. So we were trying to determine, we couldn't even find where it came from, but where the metal was coming from is, you know, was it 505, 507, that front clearance between, that, that one you use feeler gauges where you, where you measure the, the clearance between that little tang up in there? Okay, so I measured it, and it was good, but what had happened, I bought a brand new crankshaft from uh, ECI, but I also had the crank case surface and line board because, why? Because the last person who built it didn't do wet torque, so the whole thing was fretted. So I had to have a surface and line board on the crank case, <laughs> and the crankshaft is bad, so I bought a new crankshaft. So put the two together, there's this problem. So, so we called ECI and said we have this problem. I know it's been a long time. So I sent them the, that, those parts back, and they, they admitted, okay, they, we, we got some little problem here. We didn't machine it quite right, and this is on us, and don't worry about it. And, well, that was a load off my mind. You know, it wasn't a dimension I could have ever have checked. It just wasn't. It had to do with the, how the radius was cut into one of the parts. And so uh, got it back, rebuilt the whole thing, uh, put it on the test stand, repeat the process, drain the oil, opened the screen up and it looked like it was Groundhog Day. It was the same. I was just like, are you kidding me? Again? And so we called them ACI and they got on a plane and they were there in the morning and uh, with two guys, a tech rep, and they looked at it and, and they, they took it away and, and then they called us and said they had to recall, I think, a bunch of crankshafts and stuff that they mismachined the radius in it. And the machines were out of calibration or something of that nature. And so wow. they paid for me to overhaul it again. 
And so I overhauled it for the third time that summer and put it on the test stand and ran it. And boy, when I was pulling that screen off for the third time, man, it was like, oh, please. Although the boss was really happy because that's three, three overhauls in one. I mean, he got paid three times for it. You know? it what did it matter, you know? So ECI paid for it twice. Customer paid for it once. Customer, I don't remember whose engine it was, but the customer was totally understanding and a great guy. Probably should have gave him the engine for free or something. But anyway, that was the end of that. How long does it take to overhaul the engine in the build? Uh, there's a lot of, of it sitting, though. Uh -huh. So that's the hard part. And, and, and OK, so I had one guy who would take it apart. He took one day to take it all the way apart. Uh -huh. He spent one day. Totally clean. I mean, blasted, clean, on the cart, ready for me to do NDT. Is this eight hours? Yeah. Yeah. So it's an eight-hour day. Um, I would go through the whole engine. So in under a week, I had the whole parts list done, all the measuring done, all the NDT done, cleaned, ready, uh, parts on order, and a list ready to go for machine work. And then I would usually have to send it out for additional machine work. And, and wait for the parts to come in, and, you know, new cylinders or overhaul the cylinders, um, crankcase, line bore, resurface, whatever I needed. So that would be, it would be out usually for three to four weeks getting all that stuff done, all parts came in, and then um, a week and a half in build up, and then another three days for run up. So Kevin, you mentioned that um, your engine room that you build will be much cleaner than a lab, like, so you will have like a, Kind of like a quality employee. Uh, okay, well, my first of all, I was much smaller, oh. and there's usually only one or two people in there. Oh, okay. So it was right next to where we did accessory overhaul. So maybe I'd be working on an engine while one person did accessories. So it was just the two of us coming and going. Okay. And it was, it was not very wide. It was only like half the width of this room, okay. but it was longer than this room, not by a whole lot. So it was small. Uh, it was nice because it was air conditioned and heated, and so. <laughs> <laughs> so. But yeah, and the floor was painted real nice and everything was, all the tabletops were highly varnished and wiped down constantly. And so, yeah, it was, we just kept it really clean. Uh, you guys just have a problem with, there's just so many of you coming and going and you just can't control the dirt. You just can't. Uh, okay, well, outside, inside, let's see. Debris is caught in the paper pleats. In the paper pleats, paper's cut in the paper pleats. Um, put this. I don't want to say usually. Maybe I space sometimes some filters incorporate a relief valve. Incorporate a relief valve. Incorporate a relief valve. Uh, to bypass the filter if it's clogged. Do I need to write that? Might as well. To bypass a clogged filter. Clogged filter. There we go. Um, see engines. Engines with a full flow. Engines with a full. flow. Low filter have longer oil change intervals. Oils change intervals. Most of them do. I believe there's one light coming out there. I don't remember which one it is, but they stay hold you. It's a turbocharged something where you stop to do every 25 hours. Intervals. Do you have to get an STC to convert from a screen to a full flow? No. Uh, no, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so like with Lycoming, the answer is no, because they have a service instruction that just says, applicable to all engines. All engines, if you wish to change from here to here, here is the parts list. Uh, go ahead and do it. It's, it's approved data, it's, and so um, they'll even put in there, you know, it's not a, a major change to the, to the type certificate or something. So the type certificate doesn't necessarily say, and a screen, so I don't know. So I would consider that a, a minor alteration unless the type certificate data is set. Otherwise, um, hope I'm right on that one. 
it would say right on the bottom if it's it's a major alteration or not. And it's just a three three seven, but they already give you the approved data, so it's not a problem. So you you wouldn't need a type certi a supplement the type certificate because Lycoming already gives you the data to do it. We'll go with that. Okay, but Continental, some of the Continental, especially the smaller ones like the the uh, the one fifties, they didn't have that option and Continental didn't come out with an adapter that worked quite as well. So there was uh, Champion made them and Cessna made them. Uh, uh, so you take out the screen and this part would just push into where the screen was with a big nut that would clamp down on it. So you actually screwed this in and put a, a jam nut and then that had the adapter on it. So that required a STC. That also has an AD on it, that nut comes loose. Right, it was I showed Jace, so we did a pre-flight, and I had to show him on mine. I have that torque stripe stuff all over mine. It's a big, big wad of it because that's an AD. You have to check that on every pre-flight to make sure that the jam nut doesn't come undone. Um. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Larry's going to go over a lot of this with you guys, so I don't, I don't know. I guess re repetitive is good, so. Filter and screen inspection. Yeah, he'll show you how to cut them open and do all that. So we'll just do this. Uh, how much is too much? Well, if it's your engine, a lot. If you're trying to sell an overhaul, really just a tiny little bit. No, I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> All right, so how much is too much? You get that? So, um. so is powdery better than flaky, did you say? Or <laughs> less? I don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> Metal's metal. I don't care what, uh, what, what form it's taking. It's bad. And the bigger the chunks, I guess, the worse it gets. Right. Yeah, because if it's a full gear tooth, that's really bad. So, <laughs> so that would be magnetic. I mean, non-magnetic stuff. It's just kind of small particles, and, but the quantity is what matters. And yes, quantity. All right, so first of all, some metal is absolutely normal. And if you take one of these filters out and you, you pull it, you open it up and you inspect it, a little flake or a little something here and there, I don't get excited about that. In fact, you can take this and you can wash it in, one of, in a little container, and it's very interesting then to take a magnet and see how much stuff will stick to a magnet. Well, a lot of that is just paper fuzz. And, and, and around the magnet so it multiplies what you think you're seeing. It's not as bad as you'd think. So, but people are always shocked when they do that. Like, wow, that's a lot. I'm like, eh, it's really not really. Uh, so some is normal, um, but it must be small amounts. <laughs> All right. Um, this is a thing they call the rule of thumb. <laughs> and you have to consider the fact, have you, you know, do you have, who's got little fingers? <laughs> no, <laughs> Janet. Okay, so the rule of thumb, and it's gonna be about, uh, if the metal is enough to cover your thumbnail, it's enough to warrant immediate inspection. Well, is it Janet's thumb or is it Prince's thumb? Have you seen that guy's hands? <laughs> Here's this, they're like bear claws, right? <laughs> So they didn't really specify whose thumb, but rule of thumb, if the metal. Like a piece of metal or all the metal combined? All the metal combined. Yeah, not just a piece of metal. <laughs> had a pile of it right here, but every little piece will, okay. If the metal is enough to cover your thumb, enough to cover your thumb. Thumbnail? Nail. Um, yes, it is thumbnail. <coughs> thumbnail, uh, that is enough. <clears throat> to warrant immediate inspection. Immediate inspection. immediate inspection. Um, well, I have less than a thumbnail's cost for rechecked often, anything other than the very small amount. Well, let's see. 
say less than thumbnail. And I hate to write this because really nothing is less than a thumbnail. One tiny little speck is less than a thumbnail. So less than, we could put a full, a full, I don't know if that helps, thumbnail uh, is cause for um, recheck often. So if it was like a quarter of my thumbnail, something like that, yeah, I would be really worried about it. I would, uh, I would start monitoring it very closely. I would probably do, um, I don't know, maybe another five hour flight and then buy a new oil filter and inspect that. Um, and if that was fine, maybe do it another 10 hours, but I would start checking it very often until I was either confident that it was there or confident that it wasn't. What do you think would cause it to be there once and then upon further inspection not have anything else? It would depend on how long it's been in service and what's recently happened. So if it's an engine that has not had really any major maintenance or anything done to it in a very long time and suddenly started showing up, uh, that would really, really concern me. If I talked to somebody that, you know, if I looked at it in the logbook and it said, well, the cylinder was just removed and replaced. I'd be like, well, the mechanic left a washer inside somewhere, um, you know, a piece of safety wire went through the oil pump. And it's going to depend on what kind of metal it is and what it looks like and why. So it's really could be you know, part of the break-in. I'm going to expect to see higher concentrations of steel. But we're talking about visible, though. So with the things that are visible, uh, it's just first of all, it's going to depend on what it is. All right. So uh, and what kind of engine it is. So if it's a smaller Continental, O3, GO 300s and down, my experience is if I start getting a lot of metal, aluminum, it's number one, piston pin plugs. There are a lot of bad piston pin plugs that went out. So I would suspect that. Um, if it's steel and it's con and light combing, cam and lifters, almost guaranteed. If it's, well, any, any engine that has steel, my first suspect is cam and lifters. Anything that's aluminum, small continentals, first suspect is piston pins. Um, yeah, those those are big ones that you usually get. Other than a small amount, a small amount of metal should be investigated. So, how much is normal? I don't know, you see the end of my pin? So, about that much? I don't know about how much is that. Uh, it's a, take a 3 8 inch bolt. If you could cover the, not the head, the part the wrench goes on, but the other part, if you could fill that up, I would, that from there on out, I'm freaked. It's got to, even that much I'd be pretty concerned about. So, if I wash it really good in here, I mean really well, and then use a magnet, uh, the magnet will usually fill up about that much right there, the end, of, end of a pen. But again, a lot of it's just paper and fuzz with a little tiny bit of metal in it that attracts all that paper and the fuzz to the magnet. So how do you check for the aluminum? Use aluminum magnet. <laughs> 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 the color, just the coloring. <laughs> all right. Well, let's see. This kind of falls along that. So consider the source. All right, help me out here. Consider the source. Uh, so I get a bunch of metal, but I determine it's mostly non-magnetic. Because I use my non-magnetic <laughs> magnet. <laughs> Is there somebody in here that I said to James one day? I said, You're the, who was that? It's probably about that. <laughs> Somebody's asking how to tell something was magnetic or non-magnetic, and I said, there's a special checker in the tool room. <laughs> what is the special checker? A magnet. A magnet you know, so. Oh, steel, is it steel or aluminum? Well, we have a special tool in the tool room to tell. Go ask James for the special ferrous, non-ferrous checker. 
like you need a magnet. <laughs> All right, so uh, if I have non-magnetic material showing up in my, my filter, my screen, something, what could it possibly be? Oh, I hear bearings, okay. Could be. What kind of, we have bearings, I have the, the plain bearings, I have uh, bushings, uh, the oil light bushings. Would you, if the case was spreading, would you get that in the oil? Nah, you might get it on oil analysis, but you're not gonna see it, unless it's really, really bad. But at that point, it'd be leaking out of everywhere. What else we got, bearings? Jeez, that's what I'm looking for. A major source. Um, I just kind of said this, bushings. There are some things that are bushings. Let's leave it at that. Um, crankcase. Of course, now you just asked me, well, hey, is it fretting? Are you going to get crankcase? And I said, no, not really. Then I just wrote down crankcase. So am I right or wrong on that? Well, what about my story where, yeah, where, it's rubbing, where it's rubbing? What about your light combing? What does the crankshaft rub against? What's the thrust face? Okay. Just okay. aluminum. Or camshaft, where it's riding in? Just aluminum. All right, magnetic. All right, number one. We should do this like the Family Feud thing. But I'm sorry, I remember the old family feud and everything wasn't an innuendo of weirdness. So. <laughs> and that guy kissed everybody. I was just going to say that. But Richard Dawson kissed everybody. That guy, Richard Dawson, man. <laughs> Who played in Hogan's Heroes. All right, uh, number one. Number one cause for magnetic material. Cam and lifters. Cam and lifters. Cam and lifters. Uh, how about then rings? And cylinder walls, but that's really fine stuff. Cam and lifters. L I F T E R S. Tappets, lifters, yeah, same, same word. Okay, that sounds like 820 to me.